And you have had the opportunity to interview some amazing celebrities. Uh, who stands out for you the most and, and why? That is always a question that's very popular with people. I think that what I tell people is that my experience of interviewing a lot of these incredible, incredible people is that the people that I would expect to be the most exciting often aren't the most exciting. The ones that um, have had the most significant impact in me on my life historically don't always turn out to be the most exciting because frequently I have too high of expectations. I expect them to be more than they could ever live up to be. <laughs> and the, the interviews that really stand out to me are frequently the interviews where I feel some kind of emotional connection with the interview subject after the interview that I didn't beforehand. Um, I mean, there are some people that stand out just because of the fact that people are wowed by it. You know, the fact that I was the first person on the West Coast, to my knowledge, to interview Lady Gaga is pretty incredible considering who she is and where she's at now. At that time, she was an unknown uh, underground dance music artist coming out of New York City, and I, she had this song out called Just Dance, and um, her, her publicist is a friend of mine, and I called her and I said, look, I, this girl is going to be huge. I just need to talk to her now. And that mm -hmm. stands out because we know where she's at. But some other ones that stand out really strongly, for example, are uh, RuPaul's Drag Race star Angina. When Angina came out as being HIV positive, on Drag Race, it really touched me. You know, I was with millions of viewers who were sitting there watching my television crying with her. And I emailed her and said, look, I really want to talk to you. I, that was an amazing story, and I want to tell it to my readers. And once we spoke on the phone, we just clicked, and now we're very, very good friends. In fact, I'm actually going to bring her to San Francisco in a, a couple of weeks. She's performing at my show at the cafe on May 22nd, and that's part of the extension of our friendship over the last couple of years. So those are the kinds of things that really stand out to me more than, you know, necessarily like the top Just, right. name on the marquee. How big they are, right. And exactly. uh, yeah, and I, I mean, I know you just interviewed Linda Carter, and, and I saw that you were looking to get a tattoo, right? Of, uh, <laughs> right? So, I mean, maybe that one's good. Uh, yeah. yeah. Now, <laughs> Linda Carter, I've interviewed Linda Carter three times, and um, the first time, if I'm 100% honest, the first time I was so disappointed because this is somebody that when I was three years old, I would sit in front of the television and like kiss the TV, you know, when she came on, like that kind of thing. And I was obsessed with her as a child, like, you know, the whole spinning thing with a towel on my head, up, yeah. like wrapped up so that when I would spin, it would fall down on my shoulders, like my hair had come out of a bun, <laughs> that kind of thing. Right. Um, and so the first time I talked to her, it was, it was an interview and it was a nice interview, but I didn't, you know, she, I didn't feel like she understood or cared that what she had meant to me as a three-year-old or a five-year-old or a seven-year-old. Right. Yeah. And then the second time I interviewed her, we connected a little bit more. And the third time we interviewed, halfway through the interview, she stopped and she was like, I know we're supposed to be talking about something else, but let, I need to understand why it is that so many drag queens, you know, mm. love me and like, what is drag about? You know, so it was... It wasn't that she was so interested in me, but it was about the fact that right. it felt like it felt less like a question and answer and more like two people connecting in conversation. Right. And that's that makes a difference to me. I mean, I, I know that you experience that too when you're interviewing people. If you feel that connection, it makes it different, right? Oh yeah, definitely. You feel really good, and you. I mean, you both open up a bit more, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Cool. And um, so you're a tireless activist and fundraiser for the LGBT community here in San Francisco. And I see your name attached to numerous events. So the question is, would you or have you ever considered running for a public office? First of all, thank you for saying I'm tireless because I quite honestly feel like a little exhausted. <laughs> um, and, I, and I compare myself to other people around me who are, in my opinion, far more tireless in their activism and their efforts to raise money for causes. And those are the people who inspire me to want to do more. Would I or have I considered running for office? Um, 
that was something from a very – if you go in my high school yearbook, it says, like, what I want to do. It says I want to be the governor of my, the state that I came from, which was at that time Florida. Mm. And so – Political office was something that always interested me. I have a degree. I have two degrees, um, communications and political science. And so it's something that I have always thought about. But I think like so many um, gay, lesbian, transgender, bisexual people, growing up I felt that my sexual identity, my um, sexual orientation probably would be a, too great a barrier, an obstacle. To, you know, to overcome for that to become a reality. And now I see people like my friend Bevan Dusty, who's running for mayor as an openly gay man, mm -hmm. and that inspires me. You know, I see people, if you look at um, District 8, the, they had four, um, five wonderful candidates, I believe it was five, um, wonderful candidates running for this position, all of whom were openly gay. And... Um, you know, that inspires me. If there are people like Mark Leno out there who's running for state offices as an openly gay man, that inspires me. So, you know, it would be interesting to me because a friend of mine, Anaconda, Glendon Hyde, just ran for supervisor in, in District 6 as not just an openly gay man, but as a drag queen, you know. And, wow, yeah. Um, and it, was, it was a historic event in many ways. Um, and that inspires me as well. I, I look at his experience and I think to myself, like, what would I, you know, how could I use that? What could I do differently? Is it something that would, I don't know. It, mm. It's something that, um, it's crazier things have happened. Yeah. So you just kind of leave it open and, and see, see where life brings you. Uh, that's, I didn't expect to be doing drag, you know, but, five yeah. after that fundraiser. So I don't know. It would probably be short-sighted of me to think, think where I imagine myself in five or ten years. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then on the far other end, um, I recently heard that you're campaigning to be a contestant on RuPaul's Drag Race for an upcoming season. Is 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 that right? <laughs> I am one of about 5,000 uh, uh, <laughs> optimistic performers around the country who would love to be cast on season four. Yeah, so but, that, but you're actually campaigning, right? I mean, I think you've got a team out there. Um, well, it's interesting. You know, there's a there's a group on Twitter that uh, – or somebody on Twitter has decided to kind of campaign for me, and that's something – I don't – to be honest, I don't even know who, who is leading oh, okay. that little – that campaign. It's, it's a beautiful thing, though, to think that there are people in the community and around the world who would support my efforts. That's – you know, a couple of years ago, when they were casting season two, RuPaul's Drag Race did an online campaign where they had a website set up and they had people voting. And there were girls from across the country and, and um, outside of the U.S., even Puerto Rico and all over who were campaigning on that website, many of whom made it. People like Juju B and Jessica Wilde and Pandora Box all made it onto the show and were all on that website campaigning. And there was an extended period of time where I was in the top 10 in the country, and I had about something like 26, 27,000 votes. Wow, that's, that's huge. A, that is a, that's a tremendous amount of support. And um, it makes me feel very, very fortunate to know that the community at large and the general populace appreciates mm. what I do enough that they would take even that few seconds out and, and cast a vote for me. So. Yeah. Well, good luck for you. Uh, you know, I, I'm Dorothy's closets behind you. Thank you. They're we're not they're not doing that this year, and I'm kind of glad because the actual campaign process is pretty exhausting. Mm. But um, we'll see. I, I'm I'm fairly certain that somebody from San Francisco is going to get cast, and no matter who it is, I'm anxious to support them on season four. Cool. And. Um, all right, so you are one of the hardest working people I know, columnist by day, MC and performer by night. Where might your fi fans find you next? Like, like what you know, you're, what's, what do you got going on? Well, first and foremost, they can find me every Sunday night at the cafe where I host my sh weekly show, The Glamazone, Zone, with Coyo Del Mar. And we have some of San Francisco's most fabulous drag performers there. It's uh, 8.30 to party, 9.30 showtime. There's no cover, so I encourage them to come and check out the cafe. And uh, then next up, 
huge event coming Pride Night at Great America, Paramount's Great America, or California's Great America, which is May 27th. That's Sunday night, or Friday night, May 27th. And there's going to be amazing headlining acts like Deb and the Cataracts, who are the voices and act behind that great song, uh, Like a G6. They're also going to have amazing Swedish pop star Robin as one of their headlining acts, and there's going to be great local acts as well. I'm going to be working the main stage and emceeing that so they can come and see me there as well. And I'd like to put a little shout-out that if there's any um, drag queens out there who are interested in competing for pageants, as you mentioned, I'm like a, I love a good pageant. On July 17th, uh, with the, in conjunction with the Grand Ducal Council of San Francisco, I'm going and my drag mother, Landa Lakes, we're going to be putting together the third annual Miss San Francisco Gold Rush pageant, which is open to performers across the gender and sexual identity spectrum. So drag kings to drag queens, faux kings to faux queens, and anything in between, it's open to you. It's based on uh, talent and personality as well as a desire to do fundraising and community activism. It's not going to be based on the traditional evening gown competition and swimsuit competition type of thing. Uh, we're encouraging people to come out and compete for that. Last year we had 10 amazing contestants, and we're hoping to kind of match that this year. So that's a great opportunity for somebody to get involved and be seen in the community. Those are the next few big things on my list, not to mention in between is pride, and that's going to be off the hook for everyone. <laughs> 